Greetings AP Calculus BC students. We're ready to start our topic 9.8, which really puts us into the home stretch of unit 9. There's really only one thing left to discuss, and that's really how to interact with polar curves in a way that we can find the area that's either contained within a single polar curve, which is the topic of 9.8, or an area that's perhaps uh, inter twined between two different polar curves, which is what our final 9.9 lessons are going to be about. So let's kind of start with one polar graph first. And we're going to introduce an example here towards the end of the video, but what I have to do now in this video is establish some preliminary information. In other words, I am going to take you on a bit of a journey, so I'm going to fast forward here a little bit before I go back, and I'm going to show you why this formula here works for us. This is the formula to find the area of a polar region. One half times the integration from alpha to beta of f of theta, which is just the same as our r squared with respect to theta. Not a whole lot to the formula, fairly easy to remember fairly easy to work with. A lot of times you won't be integrating this by hand if the integrand is a bit complicated. But I want to know how do we come up with this polar formula. So let's take us back in time on a little bit of a journey where we were looking at rectangular curves. Remember those days back in AB class when you were very concerned about finding the area of a region underneath a certain curve. Well, what we were trained to do back then is to divide this shape into strips. And these strips were a little frustrating. They were a little confusing because it was very difficult to find the area of one of these strips because they weren't very nice geometric shapes. The tops were curved. But if you remember, when we added more and more of these strips, and thus they became thinner and thinner, we were able to trick each of these little strips into thinking that the top was a flat horizontal line. Now, you have to think about this as a very zoomed in version of one of these infinitesimally small or thin strips of rectangle. And that's why we can use the idea of integrating f of x with respect to x. We find the distance here f of x with respect to x, or delta x is the width. And by integrating, we're essentially adding up an infinite number of these particular regions. And that always works when we're finding the area in rectangular. And our formula, once again, was just the integration from a to b of the function f of x, where this is our function. Now, we're in a different world altogether. We're now in a situation where we are going to be looking at polar area. So with polar area, think about it more like this. Maybe not the best choice of color, <laughs> but it'll work for us. So in polar area, let's just say that we've got a curve and it looks something like this. It might be a really interesting polar curve, right? Maybe it looks like that. And maybe we are concerned with finding the area that goes between this angle alpha and this angle beta. Well, instead of thinking about this as rectangular components, we are going to divide this up in a completely different kind of shape we are going to now think of this as a sector or several sectors of a circle. All that start here at the pole and kind of emanate towards the curve as such. Now there's going to be an infinitesimal number of those. And the reason is because right now we don't really have any good area formula from geometry that we can use. But if we put a ton of these sectors in here, and I zoom in, we can trick these sectors into thinking that they actually have nice rounded ends as such, so much so that it looks like 
it's a sector of a circle. Think slice of pizza here now. Well, now we've got something going for us because we all should know that the area of a circle is, of course, pi r squared. We all know that. Well, we may not remember, but there is a formula for the area of a slice of pizza, a sector of a circle, and that's just simply the fraction of the circle, right? So the angle that we're making, this theta, divided by the total angle 2 pi times your pi r squared. So it's just a fraction of your pi r squared formula. Case in point, if theta was 2 pi, you're finding the area of the full circle, 2 pi over 2 pi cancels, and you back to pi r squared. Take a look at this a little further, and you will note the pi's cancel, and you're essentially left with a 1 half r squared, and I'm going to put that theta here at the end for good measure, and if you let me go back to that slide that I showed a moment ago, all of those components are present. There's our 1 half, there's our radius squared, our r squared, and then the d theta here is all part of that theta, right? The change in theta is just simply that measure of that angle of that particular sector. And of course, notice how the boundaries are alpha and beta, right? They are Greek letters, so therefore they stand for angle measures. And by way of the video, I wanted to show you that approach because what it's going to do, if I go back to the beginning of these notes, I, I wanted to bypass a lot of this information because if you're a student of mine, I want you to read through this and sort of get a little bit more clearer picture of what's going on. It just basically verbalizes the things that I've talked about uh, here as we develop this formula. And it all culminates into what we call Theorem 9.8. And I'm going to read this one more time before we set up upon the example. If f is a continuous and non-negative on the interval alpha to beta, 0 is less than beta minus alpha is less than 2 pi. Now that's kind of important so that we don't run the risk of oh, uh, trying to find the area overlapping itself. So I know that that might be a little confusing, but we have to know that beta minus alpha is always going to be some value that's smaller than 2 pi, and it also has to be a positive result. Then the area of the region bounded by the graph, r equal to f theta, between the radial lines, the spokes of our wheel, alpha to beta, is given by this expression. I think we're armed and ready. Let's take a look at our first example. Find the area of one petal of the rose curve given by r equal 3 cosine of 3 theta. Now I want to preface this problem with a couple of facts. This problem doesn't have a calculator icon next to it. I'm actually going to use the calculator at the very end to evaluate the definite integral because the focus of this lesson is not about an integration technique. The focus of this lesson is really about how to build this expression, this definite integral, that would give us that particular area. This kind of question is a very possible type of question that you could see on the Advanced Placement BC exam. Normally it would be a multiple choice problem, and typically it's on the non-calculator portion of the exam. It might be a situation where they ask you to choose which of the following setups would give you the correct area depicted. So it is nice that the problem does tell us that this is a rose curve, so at least you don't have to fight through that battle. Now what you do have to fight through are what our boundaries are going to be, because when it really comes down to it, we know, we know that we're going to have one half times the integration of r, which is of course 3 cosine of 3 theta, all squared. You want to make sure that you have an extra parenthesis around here so that we're squaring the entire uh, expression. We don't just want the 3 theta squared. And then we have with respect to theta. That's the easy part. Ask anyone who's taken BC calculus and they'll tell you the challenging part is determining what these boundaries of integration are. What are these angle measures? So 
there's a variety of ways that you can do this, and a lot of it depends on your comfort level with this particular polar graph. Now, you might recognize this polar curve because it wasn't too many videos ago that we actually sketched it. So I will assume that, hey, maybe you've all forgotten it. That's okay, it happens. So what we could do is if we wanted to get an idea of what this graph looks like, maybe we sketch a really crude version of this polar curve. And when I say a crude version, I'm not kidding. This thing's going to be pretty bad. I don't even have polar graph paper for crying out loud. And it's not important that you as students try to make your own polar graph paper. I've seen many students do this, and sometimes you can get it to look pretty good. It'll look too bad, right? But that's overrated. We don't need to do that. What we do need to do is determine what would be some good points to get our bearings with this. So we probably think of trying to let theta be zero. Makes sense. Three times the cosine of zero, of course, is going to be three. We saw that the other video. So our first point is right there. Now keep in mind, we know that this is a rose. Maybe we don't know exactly the orientation of this rose, and that's okay. What we do want to know is, whoa, if that's the end of the rose petal, if we could get back to the origin, boom, I think we've got half of a petal sketched already. So how do you get back to the origin? Well, the question there, that's when the R is zero, right? When you're at the pole, and that's probably a better word than origin, the R value is zero. We just need to find this theta value. So go ahead and use some trigonometry and solve this equation. 3 cosine of 3 theta is 0. Divide both sides by 3. The cosine of 3 theta is 0. Take the inverse cosine of both sides. Now you're going to have to know what the inverse of cosine of 0 is. That's when does the curve cosine seem to cross the x-axis. And that happens, first of all, at pi over 2. And then it's going to happen again at 3 pi over 2. And trust me, it's going to happen more and more and more. But I don't think that we need to know all of those occasions. Because as we divide this by 3 to get the theta by itself. Those are the first couple. And it's really the first one that we're most interested in. Because we are going to go from this point to this point from 0 to pi over 6 you have just discovered your boundaries of half of the rose petal. Now before I forget, because this is only going to give us half the rose petal, you would need to double this. That's very, very important. We have to make sure that that happens. Now, if we want to get back to this rose, if you're not quite sure, does this rose graph like this? Or does it graph this blue way? Well, all truth be told, I don't think it matters because you're going to develop half of a rose petal regardless. But the answer to the question truly is the top part. Because if you remember when we tried to plug in pi over 12 the other day and we got the cosine of pi over 4 times 3, we knew that the cosine of pi over 4 was just 1 over the square root of 2. And if you recall, 3 divided by square root of 2 or 3 divided by 1.4-ish was just a little bit bigger than 2, which means that when you're outside of the second concentric circle, which is maybe right about there, that's your next point on the pi over 12 spoke. So this is what that petal is going to look like. I'm going to go ahead and send you over to the graphing calculator and we'll compute this area and see what we got. Boom, here we are. That was pretty quick, wasn't it? So we take that rows, three cosine three theta, we encase it all in, in parentheses so we can square it, and we just integrate from zero to pi over six. Now the two times a half seems a little bit redundant because we know that's going to be one, but I wanted to put that in there just to show you that I didn't completely forget it. And we get an answer of 2.356 that we'll just round. And that will depict the area of that rose petal. So let's go ahead and call this approximately 2.356. Now, as I mentioned before, 
it would not be the most difficult thing in the world to integrate this. A lot of it depends on how much exposure you have had to dealing with a cosine squared of, of alpha. There's a formula that you would use for that, which is one plus the cosine of two times that alpha all over two. And this is fairly easy to integrate. If alpha in this case is three theta, then you would have a six theta in place of the two alpha. And like I said, it's not that difficult to integrate, but I wanted to put the focus on the setup. Now, before I go, I want to throw one other idea at you because trust me, you are always going to be challenged by boundaries. Maybe you weren't so much in this problem, but I promise the time is going to come when you're going to have to kind of scratch your head and think, wait a minute, hmm, what, what are we going to do with these boundaries of integration? So I have a little trick that a very good friend of mine, a very good teacher friend of mine who had actually had passed away a few years ago, had shown me when I was first starting to teach calculus. And he had used this analogy of being inside of a dark cave where the cave walls are the polar graph. And you're always going to find yourself standing at the pole. And you're going to take this flashlight that you have in your hands that's magical. And by a magical flashlight, I mean that you, when you turn it on, it emits light. And as you sweep that light across the wall, the light stays there and sort of sweeps out an illuminated arc. So we'll take our magic flashlight here. And let's color this magic flashlight. Let's make this flashlight, let's make it... Uh, bright yellow how about that so we're standing right here and we shine that light over here on that wall and as we move it around this wall what happens is that we illuminate this entire cavern all the way to the point where I take this flashlight and I'm actually pointing it back at myself here at the pole and I know that I swept out an angle from zero all the way to pi over 6 to get back to the uh, original location. And as I did that, I illuminated that part of the graph. Now, this graph is obviously half of a rose petal, and hence that was the reason why we needed to multiply by the two. Some students really attach themselves to that analogy. Some students really find it confusing, and, and you can just block it out if you're able to find the boundaries of integration uh, correctly otherwise. But I know this was a pretty long video because I wanted to really lay the foundation for you being able to be comfortable finding polar area. We've got several more of these to come, and I hope you just get better with each one that you watch. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time.